Hey there, brothers and sisters. I hope you are. Thank you for joining me. We're going to share 1 Maccabees, 1 Maccabees chapter 12. But first, let's share a blessing. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord God lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And I ask that in Jesus' name. And I hope you'd ask that for me too. So we've shared the whole of the Old Testament and we have uploaded it and indexed it. And thank you for helping me with that. And we're reading 1 Maccabees. I'm reading 1 Maccabees as an apocrypha. But we are sharing this so that we can build a bridge to give us context for the days of Christ, of the Nazarene, of the word, of the Messiah. And it helps us to see the political situation that was built up through these empires and the civil wars and some of the influential people that regain territory and boundary marks for Jerusalem, Judea and, and, and so on. And we've read, of course, about Judas Maccabee and Jonathan. And in the last chapter, we saw that Trypho, or Dido, um, what's his name, Diodotus Tryphon, he has raised up Alexander's son, Ant Antiochus VI, who was a baby, really, a child. And he was born in 148 and he died say 148 to one in 142 maybe 141 bc and they don't know how he died but he's using this child to regain the throne for himself to be honest with you but this child antiochus the sixth is the child of cleopatra thea who at the time is married to the current king to the current king it gets confusing to the current king demetrius the second and so the cleopatra thea she's married to the current king and this guy diodotus tryphon he is trying to elevate her child to the throne to succeed Alexander Ballas, who was actually put on the throne by the Romans, according to history. You had Ptolemy as well in the last chapter getting involved. He was helping Demetrius against Alexander. Ptolemy the sixth and Alexander Ballas, they both died at the same time, roughly in 145 BC. Alexander was murdered by an Arabians under the orders of Ptolemy and Ptolemy died as a result of battle. Then you had an alliance with Demetrius and Jonathan and then you had Jonathan saving the life of Demetrius II after he let all of his armies go and most of them divert, deserted rather to Diodotus Tryphon and then later on the writer of Maccabees relays that Demetrius did not honour the promises to Jonathan and then they go to battle. So Jonathan at this point is not friendly with Demetrius. So I hope that's caught us up. <laughs> I get confused. I don't know about you. Anyway, should we just read? Or I read. And I subtitle these. So hopefully, you know, have a bit of fun with that. I think Apocrypha. We don't know what was going on in the mind of the Lord at this point. When I, when I read one Maccabees, it often reminds me of the judges where people kind of do what's right in their own heart because they didn't have a prophet with them. So I'm not going to say that everything Jonathan did was blessed by the Lord, you know, and I haven't. I've shared that he, what he did, I'm sure, was for the best of his people according to his own understanding of the relationship that he had with God. And, uh, you know, the Lord, he prospered the people. But, you know, let's be honest with you, these kings that prosper seem to prosper quite well. They're horrible. And man, woman, doesn't matter who they are, children, kings, they're all just, you know, out for themselves thankfully we've got the righteous king haven't we and we're gonna this is all to build us up to go to the new testament where we're gonna go in a few chapters time if the lord will chapter 12 verse 1 now when jonathan saw that the time was favorable for him he chose men and sent them to rome to confirm and renew the friendship with them he also sent letters to the same effect to the spartans and to other places so they went to rome and entered the senate chamber and said the high priest Jonathan and the Jewish nation have sent us to renew the former friendship and alliance with them. And the Romans gave them letters to the people in every place, asking them to provide for the envoy safe conduct to the land of Judah. I'm sure the Romans at this point were kind of watching what was going on with Ptolemy and the Seleucid Empire. They were kind of friendly with Ptolemy, but they didn't want to get him too powerful. There's a civil war that's gone on after Ptolemy the sixth between his sons and stuff and and Ptolemy the eighth gets the throne and as I say he's barbaric and referenced as one of the most barbaric kings of the era but the the empire of the Ptolemies seems to weaken at this point 
and the empire of the Seleucid Empire is after Demetrius is never the same again. It's not. The Romans are really starting to have the you know, the final say on who these kings are going to be in these regions. They've already prospered certain kings who would stick by them in the wars against the Seleucid empires and divided up territory from that, which we've shared in some chapters previously as well. But Jonathan here is just making sure that the Romans aren't against what he is doing. And I presume they just want to stay out of it and see where the cards land. Because at the moment we've got lots of different... In Egypt they've got civil war going on. They've got brothers fighting, siblings fighting. In Seleucid Empire you've got the, the group that support Demetrius and the line from Antiochus the Great. You've got other people that support the line from Antiochus Epiphanes fighting against each other. And, and to be honest with you, you've got the Parthians also fighting against Seleucids. There are kind of lots of empires going on. And we know, no, it's not a spoiler, but it's just one. Well, we know the Romans come out and end up taking over the whole lot sooner or later, what Octavian does. But at this point, they have a Senate. And that Senate, like 320 people or something, and they elect two people every year to have a governance over them. It's very much the democracy that you know we don't have now so much but we have democracy like that in the west but they serve longer don't they but either way i think jonathan like i say is just making sure that with the romans they're not falling out with them because they're really the worry for jonathan at the moment everyone else is trying to seek his favor because he's got a lot of soldiers we're going to see he's got a big army by now Verse 5, he keeps calling him the high priest, Jonathan. I don't know how much high priest he's actually doing, how much high priest work he's actually doing, because he spends an awful lot of time in diplomacy meetings and fighting battles and being a general and so on. I think it might be an honorary title more than anything with Jonathan, but maybe he was a good high priest. Can't read about him much in Jewish sources, you see, being a high priest. And I think that's because they don't like the fact he wasn't from the line of Zidok. Anyway... And the Romans gave them letters to the people in every place, asking them to provide for the envoys safe conduct to the land of Judah. Verse 5, this is a copy of the letter that Jonathan wrote to the Spartans. The high priest Jonathan, the council of the nation, the priests and the rest of the Jewish people to their brothers, the Spartans. Greetings. Do you think they use high priest instead of judge? Because he really was like the judge, wasn't he? Like the judges. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't want to call himself that. Anyway, to their brothers the Spartans, greetings already in times past. It was a long time past as well. <laughs> this made me laugh when I was researching this. Already in times past, the letter was sent to the high priest Anias from Arias, who was, your, who was king among you, stating that you are our brothers, as the appended copy shows. This letter was sent. Anias I was high priest from 323 to 290 BC, around the time of Alexander the Great. And Anias I was king of the Spartans from 309 to 265 BC. But Josephus actually says that Anias served around the time of Alexander the Great, but he died at the year that he kind of, yeah, 323 roughly, wasn't it, that he died. But either way, they've kept a copy of this letter. The Hebrews are very good record keepers, are they not? And now they're giving it to... <laughs> I mean, someone give you a letter from a deal that someone had given you 160, 170 years ago, would you think it still applied now? You know, in empires and stuff. It just made me chuckle. Anyway, you got to butter them up somehow, haven't you? So what they're saying is their brothers the Spartans, greetings. Already in time past, the letter was sent to the high priest Anias from Arias, who was king among you, stating that you are our brothers, as the appended copy shows. The fact they haven't got a letter in the interim shows they weren't very brotherly at all. Otherwise, they would have had frequent kind of <laughs> better letters and more common letters than this ancient manuscript to kind of show. But either way, stating that you are <laughs> and you see the political flannel that's going on here as well. You know, they don't they don't mean it. They just don't want them to get involved in any scuffling around. You know, they want to check with Rome and Sparta that, that they're going to be left alone. And that, that in effect, then they've got independence to a point. Because the Seleucid, they're too busy fighting among themselves and so are the Egyptians. So really, Jonathan's got quite a strong position. But he's going to 
make a deal again with the devil, I'm afraid, and it's going to cost him, which is in the form of Trifon. Anyway, Jonathan, the High Pri Council of the Nation, already in times past, a letter was sent from our High Priest Anias to Arias. Verse 8, Anias welcomed the envoy with honour and received a letter which contained a clear declaration of alliance and friendship. Therefore, we have no need of these things, since we have, as encouragement, the holy books that are in our hands. That's the law and the prophets. We have undertaken to send to renew our family ties and friendship with you so that we may not become estranged from you for considerable time has passed since your letter to us. They don't even know these guys. Yeah, it's been a while since we spoke. Yeah, 170 years. You know, gotta laugh, haven't you? But, uh, you know, I think the modern politicians are bad for, you know, stretching the, the, the yeah, anyway, stretching the, the truth a bit. Verse saying it's considerable time since we spoke yeah this is a very long time verse 11 we therefore remember you constantly on every occasion both at our festivals and on the other appropriate days at the sacrifices that we offer and in our prayers as it's right and proper to remember brothers do you think they did that they didn't keep the feast for themselves let alone for the spartans let's be honest in malachi we read malachi which was you know before before uh, alexander the great but let's be honest when, when we're looking at the Hebrews, the history of the people didn't really change that much, did it? Anyway, we were unwilling to trouble you and our allies and friends with these wars, for we have the help that comes from heaven for our aid. So we were delivered from our enemies and our enemies were humbled. We therefore have chosen Numenius, son of Antiochus and Antipater, son of Jason, and have sent them to Rome to renew our former friendship and alliance with them and we've commanded them to go also to you and greet you and deliver to you this letter from us concerning the renewal of our family ties and now please send us a reply to this and this is a copy of the, le of the letter that they sent to Anias King Arias of the Spartans to the high priest Anias greetings it's been found in writing concerning the Spartans and the Jews that they're brothers and are of the family of Abraham so are the Idumeans, the Edomites, family a lot, and the Ammonites as well. That didn't stop them murdering them, did it? Either way, verse 22. <laughs> this is just political stuff. You can see why it's apocryphal, can't you? It's this complete flannel for the most part, let's be honest. It's, but it's, they're saying nice things. They're trying to point out some genealogical... That didn't help the Samaritan woman at the well who wanted to go to worship at Jerusalem. And she was probably a lot closer to the Hebrews than the Spartans were ever going to be. Uh, in their hearts anyway but you know and now verse 22 that we've learned this please write to us concerning your welfare please tell us about your welfare we on our part write to you that your livestock and your property belong to us and ours belong to you and we therefore command that our envoys report to you accordingly verse 24 now jonathan heard that the commanders of demetrius had returned with a larger force than before to wage war against him so he marched away from jerusalem and met them in the region of hamath for he gave them no opportunity to invade his own country territory hamath is upper syria northeast of coal syria it's on the edge of the boundary of the region that jonathan controlled but further north even than that he sent spies to their camp and they returned and reported to him that the enemy were being drawn up in formation to attack the Jews by night. So when the sun had set, Jonathan commanded his troops to be alert and keep their arms at hand so as to be ready all night for battle and he stationed outposts around the camp. When the enemy heard that Jonathan and his troops were prepared for battle, they were afraid and were terrified at heart. So they kindled fires in the camp and withdrew. But Jonathan and his troops did not know it till morning for they saw the fires burning and then Jonathan pursued them but it didn't overtake them for they crossed the Eleuth Eris River Eleuth Eris River so Jonathan turned aside against the Arabs who were called Zabadeans and he crushed them and plundered them then he broke camp and went to Damascus and marched through all that region what Jonathan is on a he's on a to be honest he's on a conquest thing isn't he at the moment he's trying to get all the land back that he possibly can while he can and govern that as a Hebrew land. I think he's looking and trying to regain the land that Joshua had, and maybe even the land that was promised, because the land that was promised under the law was much more than they actually got.
during the time of the judges because they didn't invade the lands that they were told to invade. But Jonathan here is on a mission to to just defeat enemies, to crush people. And, and they were successful for a point. Verse 33, Simon also went out and marched through the country as far as Ashkelon and the neighbouring strongholds. He turned aside to Joppa, took it by surprise, for he'd heard that they were ready to hand over the stronghold to those whom Demetrius had sent. And he stationed a garrison there to guard it. Jo Simon was very wise. His father Matthias called him wise in chapter 2 of 1 Maccabees, and he is very clever, this John Simon that we're going to see. He was high priest as well. Verse 35. When Jonathan returned, he convened the elders of the people and planned with them to build strongholds in Judea, to build the walls of Jerusalem still higher, to erect a high barrier between the citadel and the city, to separate it from the city in order to isolate it so that its garrison could neither buy nor sell. So they gathered together to rebuild the city part of the wall on the valley to the east had fallen and he repaired the section called Kafinatha. Kafinatha. Simon also built a dida in the Shephelah. He fortified it and installed gates with boat with bolts. A dida was west of Modin, the hometown of Matatias. And I might have it on this map. I don't know if I have though. Either way, Modin. I'll just give you Modin. Why not? It's kind of like there where my finger is. There, yeah, there. So it's just west of there in Judea, anyway. So Simon also built up a dida in the Shephelah. He fortified it and installed gates with bolts. Verse thirty-nine. Then Trypho attempted to become king in Asia and put on the crown and to raise his hand against King, to raise his hand against King Antiochus. So here you've got Trypho attempting to become king of Asia put on the crown to raise his hand against King Antiochus. King Antiochus was this child, Antiochus the seventh, and he was the son of Cleopatra the, uh, let's say, born 148 BC, died, he was about between seven and nine years old, uh, just a, quite a big region, we don't know exactly when he died, 142, 141 BC. Some people say that he was killed by Trypho. Diodotus Tryphon was a general of Alexander Ballas, and he was playing political games here. And as I say, he was a high-ranking, obviously, general of Alexander Ballas. And he wanted the throne of the Seleucid Empire. And he won the throne of the Seleucid Empire for a very short time. But he did this on the back of Antiochus the Seventh, this child of Alexander Ballas and, and Cleopatra Thea. So, yeah. So, verse 14. He feared this Trypho died. Diodotus Trifon. If you look him up, you'll see it's quite a charismatic kind of amazing figure, but cruel, you know. They were cruel, and, and he's playing, he wants the Seleucid throne. It's weakening Demetrius' kingdom all the time, this infighting. Anyway, verse 40, he feared that Jonathan might not permit him to do so, but might make war on him, so he kept seizing, seeking to seize and kill him, and he marched out and came to Bath Shan. Jonathan went out to meet him with 40,000 picked warriors and he came to Beth Shan. Beth Shan is a city in Issachar. It means house of rest, house of rest. And it's where, I think, the bodies of Saul and Jonathan were fastened to the wall. It became known as a distinct area rather than a city, Beth Shan. It became known as the district. And you see that in 1 Kings 4 verse 12. Verse 42, when Trypho saw that he'd come with a large army, he was afraid to raise his hand against him. So he received him with honour and command, commended him to all his friends. And he gave him gifts and commanded his friends and his troops to obey him as they would himself. Then he said to Jonathan, why have you put all these people to so much trouble when we are not at war? Yeah, dismiss them now to their homes and choose for yourself just a few men to stay with you and come with me to Ptolemy. And I'll hand it over to you as well as all the other strongholds and the remaining troops and all the officials. And we'll turn around and go home for that's why I'm here. So this Trypho, 
Diodotus is saying to Jonathan, you don't need to come out to war. I've come to seek peace. I just want to hand over the garrisons to you and the soldiers because all I want is not just not for Demetrius to regain the position here. And as soon as I know that you're in control, then I'm just going to go home and give up because that was my, I just wanted to weaken Demetrius, that kind of stuff. He went to an awful lot of trouble, didn't he, to, to do that. And of course, Jonathan, he's heard it before, but he's going to give him the benefit of the doubt. It's going to cost him as well. Verse 46. All these guys Jonathan made a deal with, these local, you know, they weren't local, but these empires from you know, Seleucid empires, these uh, these different kings, they all backed out all the time, didn't they? Why would he believe it? But Jonathan keeps prospering by this infighting. So he probably thinks, that, what happened was this, he goes with a thousand, it's going to tell you here, three thousand. But I think it was a thousand men that he went with and... Uh, he thought he'd be quite strong in Ptolemy with a thousand, but it was a trap. Now, he doesn't kill him here, Trifo, spoiler alert, but he will. And he does it cruelly as well. He tries to weaken Simon. And Simon, of course, so that he doesn't, you know, so that he doesn't look like a bad brother or go against the law in any way to, you know, be complicit in, you know, taking the leadership because Jonathan's death. He, he tries to placate this diodotus trifon but he murders him anyway and simon ends up getting victories over the uh, yeah these people instead anyway spoiler that was verse 46 jonathan trusted him and did as he said he sent away the troops and they returned to the land of judah he kept with himself three thousand men two thousand of whom he left in galilee while one thousand accompanied him but when Jonathan entered Ptolemy, the people of Ptolemy closed the gates. They seized him. They killed with the sword who, all who had entered with him. They didn't kill Jonathan yet, though. Then Trypho sent troops and cavalry into Galilee and the Great Plain to destroy all Jonathan's soldiers. But they realized that Jonathan had been seized and had perished along with his men. And they encouraged one another and kept marching in close formation, ready for battle. When their pursuers saw that they'd fight for their lives, they turned back. So they all reached the land of Judah safely and they mourned for Jonathan and his companions and were in great fear and all Israel mourned deeply. All the nations around them tried to destroy them for they said they have no leader or helper. Now therefore let's make war on them and blot out the memory of them from humankind. Now Jonathan's not dead yet and Simon, he was to me, he was one of the greatest of the Maccabees, if not the greatest, because he's very wise as well. And he regains a lot of land, all of this Philistine area. He was high priest, Simon, as well. The young, you know, there we go. And he was the last of the Maccabean brothers, Simon Maccabee. We're going to get into it. I was going to tell you his history, but that would spoil the Bible studies. So I don't want to give you it now. Let's do some work and share it together, eh? That's why I say this is a short Bible study because it's a short chapter. The chapters are long. I normally like to do Maccabees quite quickly, but there's a lot going on as well. But we'll get there. We'll get there if the Lord will. And then we'll do these 16 chapters. We're nearly, you know, not so far away from 16. And I'm enjoying the journey through history anyway. I hope you are too. If you want to add to the study, leave it in the comments for other people. It's important. Other people, we feed off each other. And the knowledge oftentimes leads us to other places and the Lord in our world, in our walk, he, with me anyway, sometimes through something that would seem kind of just vague to other people, that will lead me to something that I need in my life. I'll tell you a secret. I'll do an anecdote because I've got a couple of minutes on the study. Why not? I didn't know what to do about a gift for my, na for my niece and nephew at the weekend because my sister had, uh, for me, she'd, she'd been you know, a little... Um, how can I put this kindly? I'd had a disagreement with my sister about the way that she had taken a certain amount of money off my mother. And I didn't know what to do about this because I didn't want to reward her with more money. And I normally send my niece and nephew some money for their birthday. And then she's got two, two nieces, rather, which was their birthday on the same day. And I didn't know what to do. And I was, I was turned on there and I just left it until the day because I... 
I didn't know what to do about this. And they never say thank you anyway. And, and I thought, well, you know, I, I haven't spoke to her since um, before Chris, well, Christmas time when I sent the money then. But I didn't want to reward bad behaviour. My mum's she's disabled, so she can be quite an easy target for people with, you know, when it comes to money. And I know she's, you know, she'll struggle then because she's getting on now with their paying heating bills and, and for that then she'll end up coming to me or my granddad or something and I didn't want to reward my sister because she she took quite a lot of money off my mum for decorating she said or something and um, so but then I thought well I'm not going to send her any money this time but then I thought well I can't punish the kids and then I turned on the <laughs> turned on a sermon I was watching online because I, I, I joined in with these some local churches online sermons sometimes well quite every week really and then and he says i want to talk about loving your family <laughs> and um, and to most people they probably think well you know i've heard it all before to me i prayed on this the night before on the saturday night so i don't know what to do about this i'm in a sticky spot i don't want to punish the children for the parents but to be honest with you so the situation is such that i've, I've got a heart to to send them anything not either because the children ever say thank you or because the mother has been so, you know, to be, been so disloyal to her parents, like, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, the message was almost, to me, it was uh, just ignore that and just do what you can to kind of encourage love. So I did, and I just sent them £20 each. Not, not a lot, but it's the principle that I sent them something. And um, that come probably from, most people would have probably listened to that sermon and thought, well, yeah, I've heard this before. To me, it was an answered prayer. And that's sometimes what comments and stuff do online for people. It just does. That's why I say it's important. And also, it's it's truth. So if I make a mistake or something, then point it to an answer when it helps someone to get to, to get truth. And I don't want to lead people astray because I'll be held to account. And I'll never do it on purpose. But, you know, no one's perfect and we all make mistakes. So, yeah. So thank you for helping people. That's what I want to say. Thank you for contributing to the study. Thank you for putting up with me. And God bless you and your family. Until next time, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.